when you're making a comedy, uh, it's not unusual to say, um, you know, let's let's go. This isn't a movie moment. This is a cartoon moment. Let's really go with that. And generally, what you're talking about is, you know, that Tex Avery, that Chuck Jones school of filmmaking, with kind of you know an energy, a fast exit, a something falling out of frame, or something popping into frame. startling, uh, funny, um, uh, satirical kinds of ideas. Uh, you know, uh, look to the camera, say a line, and boom, you're out. And don't think it hasn't been a little slice of heaven, because it hasn't. So when they say cartoon in comedy, I think very often what they really mean is that sort of Warner Brothers school. You don't have to walk out of a scene. You zip out, like so. It's a part of animation. And zip back in again. After which, you vibrate to a stop, like so. The thing that I feel that is imperative in any action is the anticipation. Anticipation is really telling the audience what is about to happen. If I'm going to go pick up this cup, you see my hand very clearly, and I show it to you and say, see this hand? This hand is going to grab something, and now we're going to grab it, pick it up. A new animator will just go grab it, and the audience missed that whole thing. An anticipation drawing is when a character prepares to do a movement. Usually it's a small movement, you know, where a character will go in the opposite direction to the direction that he is going to go in. That's really what an anticipation drawing is for. In some cases, it can be exaggerated, you know, so if Bugs Bunny is going to zip out of a scene, you can see a big anticipation before the zip. Ready? It's surprising how hard these cartoon trees are. And that's just the movement, but just before you pull it, you, you let go of the bow and arrow, you pull it back a little bit to free your fingers. Into that comes another thing that, that is important that, uh, that I would say that was discovered more at Disney's than any place else, and that was the difference between primary and secondary action. Primary action is the main movement of a character. Secondary action are the extra movements that give the character flavor and nuance. And you, when you stop, if you're wearing a cape or a loose clothing, why well, you will come to a stop, but your clothing will continue to go on. This looks like a job for the man! Avenger! And that secondary action has no prime reason for being. Well, you know what electricity does, but you don't know what it is. And certainly it's true wind, because you can only tell them by what happens to something else. So that's really a secondary action. When a bull disappears, it's hard to make a huge animal like that disappear without leaving something even though they don't wear horseshoes because they have split feet. They just leave some of them whirling around where, where he'd been, the marks of his feet. There, that's better. A rabbit? Yeah. I did that with also the witch. When the witch would zip out, why, she would leave bobby pins. And I <laughs> love that. Because <laughs> that was a secondary action, you see. It was only provoked by her going out and leaving that whirl. And so, good action, funny action, nearly always can be rational. I mean, if you have a guy in the foreground, and it took me a while to understand this, didn't even have to animate that thing. If he's in the foreground, and then he disappears, but there's a trail of dust across the desert, you don't need any animation. You put a little sound effect in there to help it, and you've got it. Overlapping action uh, is all about speed. That there's a momentum of something that is moving in one, one direction, and if you change direction, it, 
everything doesn't just change direction at the same time. There's this whole process where if the coyote is racing after the road runner and he's going to change direction, he, his head might start looking first and his feet continue out this way and then... Essentially, the character becomes a secondary action. The thing that makes it funny is he lands back on the pillow and he doesn't know that anything's happened. He, he, you know, he comes up looking around like, what is this? In the Chuck Jones tradition, that happens all the time. People are constantly being flattened and then they pop up into three dimensions again. They're inflated. They get pumped up, they get filled with water and gas and helium. They get slammed into walls and uh, they have an infinite plasticity, which is kind of his trademark, I think. That's where Tex Avery kind of moved in on me. Where I felt that carrying absurdity to, up to a point and then adding to it at that point. And after all, the number of muscles were available, so I went as far as muscles could go and then kept adding. I mean, what nature couldn't supply, I supplied. When you see a Chuck Jones character in the beginning of a film, you know that that person or that animal is not going to stay in that shape for six minutes. Believe me, nobody falls all together. Meep, meep. The idea that the coyote would fall out of frame and his body would fall and his neck would stretch was just sort of this, this you know, an evolutionary idea. You exaggerated what is natural, you know. But, uh, you know, even when, when, when Chaplin and some of those guys would fall, their hat would come off. I mean, they'd fall off from under their hat, and then the hat would fall. It was a perfectly natural thing to have the different parts of the body, and, but in order to do that, we have to leave something to us to let make the neck long enough so that it's visible. I keep his head there because his head has to express the opinion. The rest of it is a series of events. It's like if you, if you take a string and put, like, uh, with balls on it and hold up the string, they will fall, but they won't all fall at once. Meep, meep. They'll fall as they're goosed by the other one. And they're quite a ways apart as they fall through the air. We're just accenting what is natural. When we did Ricky to Itavi, I knew that I wanted a mongoose to move like a mongoose with incredible speed. Think of Ricky Tiki Tavi as a railroad train. What I do is I just hold the tail end like a, like a caboose of the train. It doesn't move until the impact of the movement comes back to it. When you talk to Chuck, he's always encouraging you to go to the source, to study real life, to study art, and apply that to your animation. It's not just drawing funny faces. I love the integrity that he brings to this medium. When the first cobra spread his hood to keep the sun off. Marion, my wife, was doing research for me on, on mongooses and cobras. She found a film of a, of a cobra. It's shot right at the camera. You, you realize there's a point beyond which you cannot, you cannot uh, editorialize. You can't make it more dramatic. I haven't, for myself, thought about what the, what the distinction is in terms of uh, why a character has to walk on two legs or why four legs. Uh, I suppose it's just whatever the, uh, the moment uh, requires. He, he was a wonderful little character. And of course, everybody sometimes has seen a dog. And who isn't nervous? He, he is the epitome of nervous. And that's the way he is. He, he explodes all over the place. And that whole idea of the little dog coming and barking and the cat always ending up with it hanging onto the ceiling. Do you remember how that picture ended?
And Chuck actually did a good number of cartoons that were just one-offs that never really reappeared, and a lot of people don't know them, but he did one called Much To Do About Nutting. About a squirrel trying to break open a coconut. It was a real squirrel, not an anthropomorphized squirrel. And no dialogue. That was something I was simply determined to do. It's not easy for a squirrel to get across the street. But I also discovered this, they don't move evenly. So I decided I would try to make it not just look like a squirrel, but act like a squirrel. And when the squirrel goes up a tree and it wants to look around, it, it, it turns quickly and looks around, then bears up here and looks around. These things sound a little obscure, but the more you know about animal behavior and animal characteristics, the easier it is to understand. It's much easier to humanize animals than it is to humanize humans. So that's why I stuck with animals. Ah, oh, there's nothing to it. Humans are suckers for dogs. All you gotta do is give them the big soulful eyes routine. The worst you can say about a dog is he's a professional dog. I don't know that dogs can have that kind of emotion, but they sure look like they do. And Charlie, of course, he, he was just an epitome of the kind of dog, knowing he was a dog, he used any, every effort to exist as a dog. Big soul flies routine. Gets them every time. Well, nearly every time. At the end, he tries to, uh, Porky becomes so insane with this guy being there that Porky goes out and hits the big soul flies routine. <laughs> And then the car comes up and picks him up, and then you realize it's the city pound. I always thought that the extreme facial expressions were not as interesting and not as effective in getting laughs as when they sort of resembled um, humans, in the sense of when they played uh, more deadpan, it tended to be a bit, uh, I, I don't know that it's a big laugh out loud laugh, but it, they were much more endearing because of that. Particularly in the later films, Chuck became very fond of using the smallest possible gestures, uh, facial gestures, to get laughs. Uh, Bugs Bunny wriggling his eyebrow uh, could be a big laugh. That's not a subtle laugh, a big laugh. Daffy, you know, looking at the camera and just doing a kind of a camera look. That's the kind of thing that goes back to Oliver Hardy's camera reactions, let's say. Gang, isn't she lovely? Those small moments and those small gestures he found could get as big a reaction as any gigantic slapstick action set piece.